if you've ever wondered what a conductor gets up to at home, which would be a bit weird of you, uh, COVID-19 lockdown is probably the worst time to ask. At the moment, it's a case of me getting to the next level on Call of Duty and trying to buy shares in the local Chinese takeaway. But um, aside from this odd reality in which we all find ourselves, uh, my name is Tim Henty. Welcome to my home. Uh, I'm a conductor, arranger, orchestrator and editor, and my interests as a conductor go from symphonic repertoire through opera and ballet, jazz and pop, and finally to the relatively new but consuming love in my life, which is conducting film scores live to projection. By that, I mean that during a concert, a movie is projected for the audience, complete, but with the exception of the musical soundtrack. Underneath the cinema screen sits an orchestra who play every note of the score in synchronisation with the film. The idea of a live-to-projection film concert has grown to become a worldwide phenomenon in recent times. Audience flock, sometimes over 10,000 of them at a time, to see their favourite film and savour the magic of a live orchestra playing iconic music. For a performing musician, this is a huge joy for us. Not only do we welcome familiar audience members who have an old love of orchestral playing, but we get to introduce a completely different audience, young and old, to the magic of the orchestra. Attending primarily because of their love of film, it is often the first time that some of the audience have ever seen an orchestra in action. So in uh, December 2019, I was lucky enough to make my debut with the fantastic London Mozart players at the newly refurbished Fairfield Halls in Croydon, which was my local concert hall as a child. And we performed The Snowman live to projection together. And uh, they've now kindly asked me to talk a little bit about this type of concert, how a conductor precisely synchronises the score to the film and what the various pitfalls are. But to begin with, I think we should start by noting that the journey live to projection film music has taken has been something of an arc. In the days of silent film, seeing a film with live music is precisely what you would have expected. Cinema pianists and later Wurlitzer organists became well known in their own right and wrote or improvised music as they saw fit. But it was as early as 1908 when the American composer Nathaniel D. Mann wrote the very first recognised film score to the fairy log and radio plays, which was an early attempt to bring The Wizard of Oz to the screen. Just four months later, the French historical drama The Assassination of the Duke of Guise premiered in Paris with a score by the eminent Camille Saint-Saëns. To have such a famous composer write a premeditated score to the film, synchronised live by the players, elevated the relatively new genre of cinema from entertainment to art. Critics praised not only the music, but the high levels of production values across the board. A new era of art films had begun, where high levels of musical attainment were prized. You know, what is immediately apparent in Saint-Saëns' score is that the elements of much more advanced film music are all, are all there in a remarkably well-formed way. Um, you know, it shows uh, just how a fantastic a composer he was. Uh, so taking cues from another art form that involves synchronising music to action, Saint-Saëns' music is almost balletic here. Uh, he shows a keen eye for dramatic shape, cinematic shape, dramatic colour, and using those principles to create music that elevates the action on the screen and does so remarkably well. And that, in essence, is what all non-diegetic film music has always been designed to do. Like a Wagnerian leitmotif, commenting or even foretelling drama, or the orchestral accompaniment to a Poulenc opera, for example, which 
in my opinion, often gives the listener a sort of three-dimensional insight into his character's emotions and intentions. Film music is much the same. It allows us to heighten action, deepen emotion, and create atmosphere. Saint-Saëns and those who came after him started an unstoppable journey whose next major stop was the talking picture. Wait a minute, wait a minute. You ain't heard nothing yet. Wait a minute, I tell you. You ain't heard nothing. You want to hear Toot Toot Tootsie? All right, hold on, hold on. Lou, listen, play Toot Toot Tootsie, three chorus, you understand? And the third chorus, I whistle. Now give it to him hard and heavy. Go right ahead. Toot Toot Tootsie, goodbye. Toot Toot Tootsie, don't cry. The little Choo Choo Train, that takes me this in 1927 was a major technological breakthrough that opened up a world of possibility regarding the synchronization of sound and film. It was made possible by the Vitaphone recording system. It was literally in uh, Latin and Greek, um, Vitaphone living sound, uh, which involved uh, a record player running in sync with the projector in the cinema. It was not all plain sailing. It was extremely easy for the Vitaphone system to get out of alignment and very difficult for it to get back together again during the course of a cinema screening, something which was often comic for contemporary audiences and which was later famously parodied in the 1952 film musical Singing in the Rain. With the development of the talking picture, the evolution of the film score rapidly progressed. Consider that it was only six years later in 1933 when the amazing film King Kong was made. Initially, so much hype had been made about the groundbreaking special effects used in King Kong that the film studio, RKO, didn't think it was worth writing a new musical score and asked the composer, Max Steiner, to weave together some of his other music. However, the director of the film, Marion C. Cooper, strongly disagreed and paid Steiner $50,000 himself to write a new score. Steiner took this idea, ran with it, and the result was the first complete feature film score recorded with a 46-piece orchestra. This groundbreaking achievement has been lauded and re-recorded ever since. With film scores being written at breakneck pace, recording them became a major part of the film industry. Film studios set up their own scoring stages and formed their own orchestras. As East European emigres fled to America during the Second World War, bringing their musical talent with them, the sound of the film orchestra changed. The dark intensity of composers such as Korngold and Steiner was matched by fulsome, passionate string playing. Those elements together contributed to a new style of playing that has been iconic in film ever since. Initially, the brief of the studio conductor was seemingly simple. A scene in the film was perhaps two minutes long, for example. The composer's music, and the composer was very often the conductor, was imagined to also be around two minutes long. A clock would be set in the studio and the goal was to record the music within that relatively accurate time frame. But of course, as film got more complicated, synchronization became much more important. It was necessary to be more and more precise. Perhaps even one triangle note would be exactly synchronized to the blink of an actor's eye. And so, in the 1940s, the composer and Hollywood giant Alfred Newman created a visual system to accurately synchronize picture to music. Uh, the Newman system is still in use today and it's largely what we use to uh, synchronize music using visual cues as conductors not only in the studio but in live performance as well. 
Alfred Newman came up with the idea of taking a copy of the film reel, the nice old fashioned one, remember, uh, and also a hole punch. And at precise intervals, he would punch a hole in that film reel. When he played the film back, he would see a white blip on the screen where he'd punched his hole. The closer the punches, the faster the music, the further the way, the slower the music. And for speeding up or slowing down, or for getting into tempo changes or new scenes, he took a palette knife and scored vertical lines down the film gradually, frame by frame, moving slightly to the right. So that when the film was played back, it seemed like a continuous vertical line was moving from left to right. Now that's the Newman system, uh, the visual explanation of where music should come in the film. And it's largely what we as conductors still use today. Although of course today, the punches and streamers are programmed on computer and superimposed. The videos with punches and streamers are very closely kept under lock and key, so uh, I shouldn't, dare not, show you uh, too much of it. But I will just show you this uh, semi-anonymous clip of uh, a film that uh, demonstrates what a conductor is watching in a live-to-projection concert scenario. And you'll get to see the Newman system in action um, and uh, understand how those blips and streamers actually work. First of all, over here we've got the time code, uh, which is measured in frames, seconds, minutes and hours. And then if I press play and move it on for a little bit, now we have uh, the Q number, which corresponds to the written score. And above here, we've got the bar number and the beat number that we have to be on in order to synchronize precisely. This tells me that it's going to give me four beats. That's rather nice of it, isn't it? Into the first bar and the first beat. And you'll see uh, Alfred Newman's streamer move from left to right to tell us that by the time it gets to this part of the screen, we have to be absolutely together. Here we go. That's to start the count. And then we get a green and go. So that's the tempo. And then you'll see that in a moment, the tempo will change. You're gonna get a white streamer going across. There it is. And then we are in a different tempo. And in a moment, we're gonna get signal to stop. And that is the uh, first cue uh, of uh, a film. Uh, here, uh, the person who has programmed it has very kindly uh, told us that there is six minutes and 10 seconds to go until the next cue, um, which uh, as far as more modern films than the one I'm showing you are concerned, is an absolute luxury. Usually we get about 20 seconds. Um, seemingly, uh, it's, uh, it's okay, uh, but this is a quite a simple cue um, with just uh, two tempi and two time signatures. Uh, imagine the more complicated music in uh, constantly changing time signatures and tempi, and you can start to understand the reason why we have to learn every note of the score by heart as conductors uh, and glue ourselves to the screen uh, in order to synchronise the music. Seemingly simple, but of course nothing in life is simple, is it? Uh, in a live concert, the orchestra, of course, doesn't see any of this. It's only the conductor that has the Newman system on his or her um, monitor in front of the score. So to an orchestra, it's a normal symphonic performance. And as well it should be, uh, because film scores, of course, are difficult enough to play as they are. But orchestras have a lifeblood of their own and have often evolved to play at a certain point on or after a conductor's beat. Now you might think uh, that if the conductor puts a beat down, the orchestra would play right there. But often for good reasons, and some not so good reasons, that is actually rarely true. A particular orchestra sounds like they do because of the way that they play and the way that they have evolved to play over generations of musicians taking over from each other. But in these concerts, 
where precision is absolutely paramount, there's no room for uh, any negotiation regarding that sort of thing. So uh, conducting a life to projection concert is often a political game as much as it is a musical game, as we have to try and be diplomats and move an orchestra where we need them. Orchestras are getting more and more used to live to projection concerts, but um, I have started that journey off with some ensembles around the world whose players were quite far into the rehearsal process before they realised what I was looking at on my screen, despite me explaining to them at the beginning. And um, on one occasion, following some pretty odd comments from some of the players, I asked my technical colleagues to run some of my conductor feed onto the main cinema screen in the rehearsal so uh, they uh, could see what I was looking at and understood what was needed. And the uh, cries of, we can't play it that fast, uh, were very quickly uh, silenced for the rest of the rehearsal period. Uh, but it should be joyfully said, of course, that the London Mozart players uh, in our rehearsal, uh, it went swimmingly and quite literally by the numbers and uh, the performance was pretty good too. So um, I wanted to uh, finish up really by talking a little with one of the most respected conductors in the live to projection field about some of the benefits of these concerts and some of the challenges for a conductor. Uh, this is Justin Freer, president of Cine Concerts, which is one of the largest live to projection concert presenters in the world, with titles including Gladiator Live, The Godfather, and of course the complete Harry Potter series. And I spoke to him a little earlier. So on. But you've conducted some of the world's great orchestras in this way, and I just wondered, uh, from your point of view, whether there are uh, any recurring difficulties that you, you notice, because it's kind of difficult to get an orchestra absolutely synchronous with the film all the time in a live setting, isn't it? There are certainly a huge amount of challenges. I mean, challenges that you, you don't anticipate at all, um, nor do you have to deal with, you know, to, to be fair, when you're conducting opera or conducting um, standard classical literature or, or even chamber music, if it requires a few gestures here and there from the hand. Um, with film, uh, well, let me back up, let me say it this way. Um, from a compositional standpoint, I, I believe this firmly that perhaps form is one of the most difficult things to get right as a composer. And one of the primary reasons, if not the first 15 reasons why Beethoven was, was one of the great geniuses in our time, because he was and continues to be the king of form. Anything you ever need to know about form, is in a Beethoven piano sonata, you know, look no further, um, you know, in, in my opinion. But, um, and form in film is given to you. You, as a composer in film, you have your form already laid out. Now, how, how you determine to section that off um, is, of course, up to interpretation, but the base form is already there. So, arguably, the most difficult part of composition is already laid out. However, um, so many other variables that are a part of this, this craft as a result of it being the craft of film music um, completely outweigh the form going away and being a little bit you know, easier over here. Everything else over here is a lot more difficult. And certainly synchronization, when we're recapitulating this art form to audiences in a symphony hall is, is a great challenge. Um, so we get here through everything, obviously the composers and the directors and the editors and, and uh, in the case of the Harry Potter series, all the way to the beginning of JK Rowling or in the case of the Godfather, all the way back to Mario Puzo's book. Um, we end up with this great product in the hall to share. And I think that with, regardless of the orchestra, I look at it like this. Um, I, I try to envision what their perspective is on stage. And for me, I try and give them the illusion that there is no film. There is only the stick. So I, I put uh, as much responsibility as I can on the role of conductor to synchronize it. And if the orchestra is worried about synchronizing to the film and to the conductor, it, it's a train wreck. Mm -hmm. And if, if they do what they're trained to do, and that is to follow the conductor, it becomes the conductor's responsibility to adjust the technique and figure out how to get, you know, in, in the case of a, you know, a London Philharmonic or a New York Philharmonic or a Los Angeles Philharmonic, you know, some of the greatest players on the planet, um, to get to a place quickly so that there is no room for were we right or were we not, they shouldn't worry about that. They have enough to worry about with the thousands of notes that they have in their books, which is another problem in itself, right? That none of this music was ever intended to be performed back to back to back to back to back. 
Mm. So they have physical challenges, they have mental challenges, they have all these other challenges that they don't don't normally have to deal with. But I think if the orchestra is able to take themselves out of synchronizing and it's all on the conductor, then we start to talk about what techniques is necessary. And and I have found that um, the speed of the downbeat is so much more important um, in this craft than than any other uh, conducting opportunities I've ever been blessed with in my career. Uh, I'm not sure how you feel about that particular thing, but regardless of tempo that that speed of the downbeat is is um is crucial um, and one of the other great challenges um from a synchronization standpoint i think is is understanding um what you need to anticipate you know i think in film music i've i've never at least for me i've never felt the need to constantly be aware of not only what is happening, but what is about to happening, and what is about to happen, and what is going to happen in some cases 13, 14, 25 bars down the road, while mm-hmm. simultaneously thinking about what just did happen mm-hmm. because it may affect what's coming up 22 bars down the road in the event that player XYZ came in early, or maybe maybe I, I, I was a tiny bit late, even maybe it's like a half a second late to a cut, and then I but I can't be a half a second late to the next one, yeah. Um, all those things, you know, I've, I don't know how you feel about that, but I've never had to be so situationally aware of music before. That's right. And the, fo- the focus that uh, you have to have as a conductor or any musician, in fact, on the stage, but from our point of view as conductors, trying to synchronize this, but also getting the best out of the music as well. The mental focus of it is incredible. And sometimes when we come out of some of our longer films, maybe Harry Potter 2 or something, um, which has got a lot of cuts in it, and uh, for various different reasons, a lot of cuts. Um, I, uh, I, I'm exhausted by the end of it. I don't know about you, but it's a, it's a, a thrilling thing to do, but it's, it's draining for us, isn't it? It's draining, and I've always found the solution is basically just to go, uh, you know, eat my weight in Godfather pizza, as he says in the good. <laughs> yeah. And um, gin and tonic, I hope, as well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, my, my, my Achilles heel is, is uh, you know, a 3,000, 3, 3,500 calorie uh, meal after a show. But um, <laughs> right, you're right, it's draining. It's absolutely draining. And, but I, I love that there is music out there and an art form out there that, um, you know, at least from my perspective, I can be in love with in this way and feel like it really is so incredibly challenging. And, and, and you know, that's one of the great things about, uh, career longevity you know just to kind of pivot away just for a, a minor second or two um is always challenging yourself you know whether or not it's through composition or orchestration or arranging or conducting or performing your instrument you know whatever it is find those places that are not your comfort zones and go there because if you don't what's the point <laughs> yeah exactly yeah yeah <laughs> So look, I mean, you've conducted a load of different films, uh, you know, not just your titles, but uh, across the world in, in various settings that are live to projection. Um, is there a particular moment that stands out for you as, as a, uh, like a scene that is particularly difficult to synchronize? You've got a lot of things going on, or a lot of things to think about that really stands out for you as a difficult problem. Um, I'd answer it perhaps with two polarized answers. One of them, um, what might feel like it's not very complicated and one that clearly is. I'm going to start with, with uh, uh, the former. The Godfather, at the beginning of the movie, about the first 32 or 33 minutes or so, is this wonderful wedding scene, which is pickled with music, not only composed by Nino Rota, but primarily by Carmine Coppola, who was, yeah. who was uh, you know, um, uh, Francis Ford Coppola's father. He wrote a lot of that Italian dance music, the Tarantellos, the Mazurkas, the Waltzes, etc. And um, the synchronization there is not so much to do with the cuts, which is where the editor is doing this or that, because so much of that movie, as we all know, is long form editing. And there's very, very, it's, you know, the, the antithesis to that might be, um, you know, the editorial nature of the, uh, the, the Bourne franchise, you know, the Jason Bourne franchise, mm. where you're lucky to, in, in some cases during the action, to have maybe more than two seconds of the same camera angle before it changes to another. Coppola was very much the opposite in this one. So the synchronization challenges in, in this scene is to make sure that the musicians, when they're playing their instruments, it actually l- sounds like what it looks like. And it's a, it's a very different way of, of approaching synchronization, but there's a lot of that in those first 30 minutes. 
to pivot to the other side, um, of all the stuff that I continue to do and have done, I feel like the Patronus scene, the Patronus slash werewolf slash lake scene from Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban wow. has not only an incredible a large amount of crucial synchronization points for, for hits and cuts, but so many of these hits and cuts are massive visual markers created by Alfonso Cuaron, the director, so that it's, it's like a double whammy. It's not just like, okay, there's a heroic moment when Harry wins the first Quidditch match and it's here on this cut and there's this beautiful John Williams theme in the brass. You gotta get that, absolutely. But you might not have the same explosiveness in the colors coming from the cinematography, which is all over the Prisoner of Azkaban. You know, Cuaron's mastery of color is incredible. And so there's another level of obvious nature to the cuts to the audience. And if you're not there with the music, it's a disaster. So, Justin, thank you so much for talking to us. Uh, and uh, it's been fantastic talking to you. And uh, these things are great. And long may they continue. And you be well. Be safe. <laughs> yeah, the same to you and all, all your listeners and colleagues. And, and I'm happy to, uh, you know, under the circumstances, you know, catch up like this. So it's great. Uh, it's nice to see you again. So, um, and you. Thank you. Please stay safe. I hope family's healthy. As I said, friends and colleagues. And, and uh, let's do this again sometime. Let's do it. Huh? <laughs> so I hope you've uh, enjoyed listening to this little talk on synchronizing music to film and especially live music to film in concert. Uh, it's quite a niche, I suppose. Um, it's a, a weird corner of the music profession, but it's one that I love to uh, inhabit. Um, I do hope that when this weird and interesting time that we're in is over, uh, the London Mozart players can see you at a film concert or indeed any of their fantastic concerts very soon. Uh, I've been Timothy Henty. Thank you so much to LMP uh, for inviting me to talk on this amazing new initiative of yours uh, at home with LMP, which is just the right antidote for uh, the times. And I wish everyone a healthy and happy journey through the days to come. Thanks very much.